Welcome back to David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsillie School of International Affairs and author of Painful Choices, A Theory of Foreign Policy Change. So far this week, we've examined the success and limitations of international law courts and injustice against women. Tonight, we're turning our attention elsewhere, to space. Who owns space? And do the laws of Earth even apply? David is here to answer some of those questions. Hi again. Nice to see you again. Let's start with the current laws that govern space. Who owns the moon and outer space? Well, <laughs> from an international legal perspective, space is truly the final frontier. It hasn't had to be an issue until very recently because we haven't put anything or anybody in space uh, until the middle of the 20th century. So for the longest time, it was a topic that nobody even bothered thinking about. But now it's a real question. How do you actually govern space? And space is what we might think on Earth of as a, a commons, right? It's a, an area that's not physically occupied by anybody, uh, not in a per, on a permanent basis. It's not the kind of thing that would lend itself, obviously, to territorial claims because there's not much in the way of territory in space unless you're going to talk about the territory of the moon or the planets in our mm. solar system and so on. So uh, it raises a different set of issues that primarily have to do with the use of space for earthly purposes, which almost exclusively means uh, allocating things like orbital slots for satellites and what who gets to put satellites where, what kinds of satellites can people put up in space, who gets to decide, uh, who gets the satellite slot if two countries want it, and uh, what, if anything, are people allowed to do if they don't like other countries' satellites. So these are the kinds of issues that basically are the subject of international space law. And there's a, a small but significant body of international treaties that does govern the use of space. And basically, it boils down to a few set of, of basic principles. One is that nobody actually owns space. Space is reserved for the, the common use of humankind on peaceful terms and on sort of basically mutually uh, beneficial, mutually accessible terms. Uh, space is not, by international law, space is not supposed to be a site of military conflict. So it's by treaty, uh, space is demilitarized. Uh, that is not to say that there's nothing in space that's militarily useful. Actually, there's quite a lot in space that's militarily useful. And if you didn't have things like uh, GPS satellites in space, the, the US Army wouldn't be able to function internationally the way it functions today. So lots of things in space actually have a military application. But uh, in, in theory, at least, you're not supposed to put weapons into space or to go up and blow up things that other countries have put into space. But as space exploration uh, grows, is, is that a growing concern as well, the militarization aspect? Frankly, I don't think it's a, a big issue because uh, space is uh, enormous and empty, and that's the kind of thing that people don't tend to fight over much. In other words, you're not likely to see a whole lot of conflict in outer space the way we see it on Earth, because on Earth, territory is limited, uh, it's full of valuable resources. Uh, people can actually live there. It's not true of space. So international laws applied to space is mostly about just making sure that international cooperation works fairly smoothly. Take me back to 1957 uh, when Sputnik is launched. A and that's really when the, the property debate over space really began. How was it decided then that the moon would belong to all of humankind? Well, the moon sort of came up later. Sputnik was not a moonshot. It was just a, uh, well, a satellite lobbed into space rather quickly, came down rather quickly. Uh, Sputnik didn't actually do anything. Mm. It was about this big and it beeped. <laughs> but it demonstrated the capacity, at least that the Soviet Union had, of actually putting something that size up into space. And it triggered the space race, which has resulted in all of the, the satellites that we do have in space now. Uh, so the moon came up later. Uh, the United States, under President Kennedy, decided that you know, he would make it uh, an American mission to put a man on the moon, to be the first country to do that, so far the only country to do that. Uh, basically a symbolic act. There wasn't a whole lot of reason to send a man to the moon because there's nothing there. Hmm. Um, we did it several times. They brought back moon rock, which proved, interestingly enough, to be pretty much indistinguishable from the rock at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. And now we know 
courtesy partly of the moon shots that the moon was at one point in the Earth's very distant history actually ripped from the Earth. So it's actually of the Earth. But there's nothing else on the moon. And it's not a place that's got resources that you could mine or, or water you could exploit or anything you could actually live with, no atmosphere. So it's not the kind of place anybody is ever going to be in a hurry to colonize. There is an international moon treaty which says that the moon is not to be subject to territorial claims. Only 13 countries have ratified it. Uh, none of the countries that has ever expressed any kind of interest in sending somebody to the moon has ratified it. So to that extent, it's generally treated as an unsuccessful treaty. But it's unsuccessful in part because nobody really cares. There's nothing in the way of a groundswell of interest anywhere to send people to the moon. And Frankly, the idea that we would actually want to colonize the moon is pretty far-fetched. <laughs> okay, I want to go beyond the moon into other celestial bodies. Uh, you know, one area of law that's not covered by any existing treaties is, is that of intellectual property. So at the International Space uh, Station, for example, the research that is conducted there is, is the property of the country conducting it. But how could international intellectual property be applied to outer space in the future? From my perspective, it it's a pretty natural extension of earthly intellectual property law because people are going to put things into space that they've invented and that they probably have some patent on. And the patent probably, well, the patent does protect its earthly use. There'd be no particular reason to think that once you sent something into space, all of a sudden it becomes some sort of public intellectual property. Mm. And there wouldn't be much pressure for anybody to treat something that way anyway. So it's not highly problematic. Uh, if, you put, if Canada puts a satellite into orbit, it remains Canadian intellectual property, and it, it, Canada's property. Uh, in fact, if a Canadian satellite comes down out of orbit by mistake and causes damage, well, Canada's actually liable. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, it's a simple extension of standard earthbound um, applications of legal principles. Hmm. Okay, I want to read you something that uh, a columnist wrote on space.com back in 2008. Here's what he wrote. Laws tend to build on precedent. Since there's little precedent for lunar laws, some look to the sea for suggestions. That is, the use of ocean floor minerals beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. Such valuable resources are designated by some as a common heritage of mankind, not subject to national appropriation. Could the common heritage concept work as a basis for a moon treaty? David, there isn't much precedent uh, on space laws. How could those sorts of international Earth laws be applied to issues around space sovereignty? Well, that would be one natural thing to do, is simply to say it's basically the space analog of the oceans. And there's a pretty well worked out international law of the oceans now, the international law of the sea. And you could fairly easily graft it onto the exploration and use of um, any surface outside the Earth. The Moon, Mars, Venus, if you could possibly withstand the heat there. Uh, so that's not necessarily uh, problematic. Uh, again, the, the main issue would be, would anybody actually need to try to energize that kind of body of law? You'd actually have to decide it was feasible to go to the Moon and to do something there, to mine it for something mm. somehow. And at present, that's just economically uh, unfeasible at the moment. So there's really no pressure to bother trying to articulate that kind of law. David, I want to switch gears here a little bit, but pick up on something that you said about mining. I'm wondering, what are the, and talk about ethical implica implications. What are the ethical implications of mining celestial bodies? Well, they'd be a little bit different from some of the ethical implications of mining uh, on planet Earth, for example. You wouldn't have to worry about displacing populations that already live there or possibly further impoverishing them. So you'd have we all think. that whole set of things, well, as far as we know, <laughs> you'd have that whole set of concerns is brushed aside. So the, the ethical implications would probably rest entirely on what you did with whatever it was you mined. Presumably, you would want to bring it back to Earth. Uh, here again, the economics are just uh, a huge barrier. Uh, there's no scenario by which it actually makes uh, financial sense to spend all the time and energy and money, millions and millions and millions of dollars, getting miners somewhere to retrieve resources back to Earth. Anything interesting in a, in a celestial body, we probably have here on Earth anyway, and could get much more cheaply locally. So it's the kind of thing that's not likely actually to materialize as a serious ethical problem. The intellectual, sorry, the property right issues 
are also sort of interesting, but in an abstract theoretical sense. So suppose you actually did manage to land a sort of a mining team on an asteroid or on the moon, and they actually could feasibly mine something there. Would it raise an objection uh, on the part of anybody else? And here again, if you treat space as a commons, the way mm. we treat the oceans, the answer is no. Everybody has an innocent right uh, to the use of the ocean's resources uh, in non-territorial waterways as long as there is enough and is good left for everybody else, as John Locke wrote way back in the 17th century. Okay, let me try this one out on you. It's probably not going to happen in our lifetimes, but let me try this out. You know, international space law raises the question of terraformation, which is putting, changing the atmosphere in space to put people like you and I uh, up there making habitable. What sort of ethical questions might that raise? Well, if you could do it, it might raise some really <laughs> interesting ones. And here, I think we're in the realm of science fiction. Uh, I suppose the real ethical issues would be what happened on those, those planets or those moons where you actually did terraform form and actually created inhabitable space. Probably you'd have the full range of ethical issues arise there that already exist on Earth. So we'd probably be in very comfortable territory. But I don't lie awake at night uh, worrying about that because uh, terraforming, frankly, just isn't going to happen. We talked about this earlier about the Moon Treaty of 1979 and, and only a certain number uh, of supporters behind it. The U.S. and other spacefaring nations rejected it. And some argue that it's time now to reintroduce that debate. Do you agree with that? What for? I, I see no country really seriously thinking about doing anything interesting with the Moon. Uh, a couple of countries every once in a while, such as India, say at some point we would like to actually send somebody to the moon, that would be an entirely symbolic thing. Mm. Uh, they would go, plant a flag, and come back, uh, just the way the Americans did, bring a few rocks with them. I can't imagine anybody seriously objecting to that, so there's not the kind of demand for a, a detailed rubric of international law to govern the use of the moon that would actually require us to spend much time and energy on it. We have more important things to worry about right here on Planet Earth. Okay, and that's where we'll have to leave it for now. Thank you very much, David Welch, for this entire week. Great conversation. Thank you. My pleasure.